Disclaimer. This podcast features explicit language and discussions sexual in nature. It may contain subjects uncomfortable to some. Please understand that the opinions shared on this podcast are not a representation of any organization or employer the host may be a part of. So this is part two of our William Marston series. Uh, if you recall, last time we just kind of covered William and Sadie Holloway's kind of backstory, them kind of growing up as young children, and we left off in the college times. We also kind of just painted like what America looked like back then. So we're just going to jump right into William's experience in college and then kind of go into Sadie Holloway's experience in college. This is really, if you think about a traditional kind of college story, that's when you, the world is opened up to you, right? So we're going to see a lot of the ideas kind of form from their college experience. Mm. Makes okay. sense. We're about to see, we're, this is essentially the origins of what would later become Wonder Woman. The origin story of Wonder Woman's author. So not her origin story. No. Okay. Origin story. Sort of. Sort of. But not really. No, it's more like uh, the origin story of the origin story. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Uh, mind blowing. So, yeah, let's dive into it. All right, let's get going. So, where we left off, William was thinking about killing himself. Some pretty heavy shit. Yeah, yeah, we're just <laughs> we're just jumping right into it. Just there we we're, go, right into it. Yep. Yeah, I think you're talking about how he used some kind of chemical acid, not the drug, of course, no, nope. um, to try to end his life. And it sounds like it was inspired by a book he was reading. Yeah, one of his favorite books, uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. He, we know that he had that book. Um, I want to say if my memory serves me correctly that his mother either gave him the book or would read it to him when he was a child. Fun little fact in the future, he his blood pressure cuff, which would later become the lie detector, was actually used in the original movie for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to hmm. gauge audience reaction. But we'll get into that later. Hmm. But it's interesting. So we left off kind of William Marston. I kind of mentioned he could do anything he set his mind to. However, he got to college and then he realized life is hard. <laughs> yeah. And he decided that if he didn't do anything noteworthy <coughs> in, his, in his life, that it just was no, there was no point in living. Right. Okay. Now, one class, however, that he really took a liking to was philosophy. Oh, that's a good class though. Yes. Ooh. Which is kind of interesting because he was going to Harvard for law, but he falls mm -hmm. in love with philosophy. So this class was taught by George Herbert Palmer. His wife, Alice Freeman Palmer passed away in 1902 and he never stopped mourning her death. Um, it is actually believed that Herbert Palmer saved William Marston's life. So the thing to the thing to note here is that George Palmer was the teacher sponsor of Harvard's Men's League of Women's Suffrage, founded in 1910, mm -hmm. the year before William accepted got accepted into Harvard. Oh wow! So the class that he falls in love with is philosophy. The teacher is the teacher sponsor for uh, pretty much the largest student organization fighting for w women's rights. And this is evidently what changed William's kind of view on ending his life. Taught by a teacher who was desperately longing for his wife that was no longer with him. Harvard is not a good if Harvard, Harvard was like a comic book character, they would be the villain in this story. Oh, really? really? Yeah, I I hate to kind of paint it like that, but Harvard 
would not allow women to get Harvard degrees. Oh, yeah, I actually heard about that. So that that's been a thing for a very long time. Yes. Um they there was an annex college where Harvard professors would go and teach the same exact class to hmm. women, but they would not receive a Harvard degree. Wow. And then also uh George Palmer and his wife were fighting for um equal education for Everybody. Female, for female students in particular, when Harvard finally s- said, like, okay, if you raise, if you fundraise $250,000 as an endowment, we will allow it. How much money? 250000 back, back in, then. like, 1910. Cool, or, that's, or, that's a lot now. Well, 1900s or something. Yeah, it's, it's an insane amount. And here's, here's the crazy part. That's like a castle like amount <laughs> right yes they fundraised the money wow they fundraised it they went to harvard and harvard told them sorry we changed our minds they took the money though hello i like money harvard said with okay you raise this money we'll 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 take your idea and we'll run with it and Harvard was like, ooh, money. Yep. What was that other thing we wanted to do? I don't remember. It's, it has nothing to do oh, with Oh, but this women. money, though. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyways, this became William's favorite teacher, uh, George Palmer. In 1911, the League announced its intent to host a lecture series. The first speaker was to be Florence Kelly, who fought for minimum wage, an eight-hour workday, and to end child labor. And now she was advocating for women's suffrage. However, there was an issue. Harvard did not allow women speakers on campus. Yeah, it's an issue. Bullshit. Huge. Bullshit. Which is, like, very interesting for, like, an academic environment. Where you should be talking on campus. Imagine a college saying that today. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, all women, you can't talk in classes. Or on, Come on school now. property at all. Right. That's nuts. If three or more people are listening to you talk, stop. But, yeah, <laughs> the, the president of Harvard at the time went on record and stated they did not want a, quote, a mob of women trooping around the yard. Trooping. Is, yeah, I just thought it's very it was, vague. Yeah, it, it almost seems like they were more concerned about like the lawn getting messed up versus, you know, because they didn't specifically say like, oh, we don't want like an angry protest. That just makes it sound like there are women everywhere and that made them uncomfortable. Yeah. But anyway, so Harvard eventually agrees under the condition that after Florence Kelly, they would, the next speaker would be someone that's against women's rights. Giving both sides, like, an ability to speak their side. Yeah, which, sure. even though yeah. it's sure. shitty. It's shitty, but it's it's the way, like, I mean, that's how it's handled in court and stuff. Like, you got to hear out both sides, even though at the time one side was clearly wrong. Yeah. So the, the college club agreed. They said, okay, you know, we will do Florence Kelly, and then we will pick – a speaker that's against women's rights, like, okay. And then they fucking rebelled, which I, like, fucking loved. Because I picture Harvard, like, college kids being, like, in their Harvard blazer and their, like, shirt ties, and they, you know, they try not to break the rules. That's, like, the very, I know, stereotypical Harvard view I have in my mind. And then they, like, went against the system or, like, fuck you. Actually, we're going to try to do the next speaker, um, another pro-women's rights speaker, which is Miss Emmeline Prankhurst. And I'm so sorry again. I need to figure this out. <laughs> like the main woman for women's suffrage. Yes. Not just mm. anybody. The head honcho. Yeah. Head honcho. This is, this is like the... Again, if you recall from episode one, you know, she was like action, not words. She is the 
the number one radical, if you want to call it radical. At the time, at the probably. Time. She would, she would, her and her followers would like chain themselves to gates and fences, for instance. Oh, yeah. Protests, so. They have like plenty of images from like women's protests in like the early 1900s uh, to mid 1900s of them like doing radical things like that. And I, I don't feel like it should be called radical. I feel like it's, it was needed. Yeah. So at the time, it was very radical. I mean, it's <laughs> for its time. For its, its time. radical. It's crazy to did. consider that radical now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exa- yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, Harvard gets really upset. They they banned her from the campus, saying, <sighs> "Quote: Worse. The college hall should not be open to lectures of women." That's a quote. That's mm. that's a. <laughs> They should be ashamed for having that be one of their, you know, quotes for their, you know, part of their history. Yeah, they, part of their. Exactly. This is this is where obviously Harvard is on the wrong side of history, and it, it's it looks really bad. Um, yeah, and supposedly because the author of the book, they actually went and looked at Harvard's records. You supposedly can go through Harvard's records, and you can pull the. <laughs> these documents out of their official response. And it's, it's very wow. sad. Um, and what's even more sad is the fact that the decision that Harvard made was supported by newspaper companies. Oof. Wow. When they printed this, they were on the side of Harvard agreeing with them. So even back then news news, any news was a very opinionated. Well, Very just, heavily influenced by politics. We can't let women talk at our school. It's crazy. Like, what are they going to talk about? I remember saying something in episode one. Humans are humans. Humans are humans. Yeah, we we all need the same rights. Like, I don't understand why we are always fighting. We're still fighting for women's rights. It is so... It's just... It's a, it's a long topic to talk about, but yeah, equality. It's in I feel like it's a fight that's getting more in women's favor slowly, but it should be it should have been that way a long ass time ago. Oh yeah, definitely. So what uh, transpires from that? So even though she was barred from campus, um, she did end up speaking on December the sixth sixth one block away from Harvard um, in a room that was designed to hold 500 people. How convenient. Um, over 1,500 people came to hear her speak. Wow. And this, like, this fascinated William at the time. Uh, William decided to take his finals before killing himself, and after making an A in philosophy, he decided a different path on his life. Wow. Yeah, like just, just from a getting a good grade, was this like some s- stuff that he wrote in his journal, and that's why we know this today? Yeah, or is okay. So this is him. This is his story. Correct. And yeah. like you said, this might be a little exaggerated, but at this, I don't think someone would exaggerate this kind of moment in their life. I mean, uh, sometimes when you do have like thoughts of self harm. When you write it down in a journal, for me, when someone else reads it, because they don't understand what I'm going through because I never show it, they would be like, oh, this is this is ridiculous. Writing that down in a journal means that that's, an, that's a reality he accepted at a point in life. Yeah. Like that, that was yeah, something that would have happened. Yeah. 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 But I think like what's like very important to note here is that if you have a good college professor – Right. They're going to inspire you. For instance, when I was going through college for engineering, there was actually a person on campus, the mental health counselor, that actually very much inspired me. And even though I was an engineering student, and even though like the majority of engineering students did not super care or were into psychology, it very much inspired me to kind of get into psychology and to at least learn enough to try to help like other college students through like mental health crisis. So yeah, I think it's just like to the, to the teachers out there, sometimes you don't even know what you're doing could like 
inspire somebody and have like profound impacts for the rest of their life? I think a lot of teachers do consider that whenever they're teaching older, like all ages of um, people, kids, you know, um, that their teaching could really like be like impactful on them. That later on in life, they'll be like, hey, thanks for teaching me how to two plus two. That really came in handy. (laughs) Is that the actual term for that? Yeah, adding two plus two. So we did mention, for instance, the the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right, that his teacher George Palmer and his wife fundraised to try to get tried to. Right. And this was the this was the annex college where college professors would go and teach the same classes. Oh. Um but you just wouldn't earn a Harvard degree. That college, fun fact, um, would later become Rad Radcliffe College. Hmm. Well, I haven't heard of it. Which is still a college today. And so going back to the idea that Sadie Holloway is kind of Wonder Woman, um, it is key to note that she went to Mount Holyoke in Massachusetts, which is a women's college founded in 1837 and actually the first college for women in the United States. Huh. Now, what I want to kind of talk about is when we speak about Wonder Woman, why is Wonder Woman from the Amazon? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't really actually... Because they're so that. thick there. They're... So you think it's like because they're strong? Sure. Maybe I I'm, I like most times when I think about like the Amazon, like the Amazon forest, I think of it as like a really rough place to live. Like you have to be, you have to have a strong uh, personality. You have to be like a strong survivor to live there. So maybe that's why. I mean, that's this is just you know. In one like of the last homes, one of the last homes of Mother Nature. Like yeah. the epicenter of Mother Nature. Yeah, it is a place where, like, if you wanted to separate a whole entire group of people, you could, uh, you could secretly live in a, I guess, a kind of like secret woman society, like um, unexplored territory, like a Wonder Woman does. You know. Okay. What, what, I don't what, know. What was the real reason? No. So these are all probably very valid reasons. However, what most people don't probably realize because this was before our time, was that the women's suffrage movement and also the feminist movement Mm. often they use the Amazonian image of, like, anyone that was going against, like, the society norm. So it became a very pro-feminist icon was, like, the Amazonian. Oh, okay. Oh. Interesting. So, for instance, like Homer, the Amazonians had a very mystic essence about them living in harsh environments, like you said, uh, stated from the rest, uh, separated from the rest of the world, which you also mentioned. When you say Homer, you mean like the ancient author Homer? Homer, yeah. Homer, oh, wow. Homer. Okay. Yeah, we're we're covering like a wide range of things here. Okay. So, I mean, Homer is a. <laughs> Not not Simpson. What a subject. So many suffragists from William's time is said to have believed in an ancient land ruled by women. Although there is no evidence to support this, keep in mind that in 1910, only 4% of Americans from the age of 18 to 21 actually attended college. And in the 1920s, this number rose to 8%. The primary reason for this is that 40% of that 8% were women. Wow. So really the number increased mo- mostly because they're like, yeah, women can go to school now. Yeah. How women get more smarter. How do they indeed? In 1911, the I- image of a Amazonian was any woman who rebelled against society, which meant anyone that thought women and men were equal or went to college. 
that is who Sadie was. She was a rebel. She attended a college, one of only seven for women in the United States at the time. And while she attended college, she was in the debating society, philosophy club, a bait club, the choir. Um, she worked for the college magazine, and she played field hockey. Field hockey. Wow. Field hockey. What an, that's impressive. Like uh, All over the place. Yeah, like that's high She's school, college years. That was her adult life. Yeah. Wow. Busy. Busy woman. Busy. And Wonder Woman on the side. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Right. Don't so, give away our secret identity. <laughs> so learning a little bit about Sadie, Sadie loved Greek above all of her other classes. Um, her favorite book was supposedly Sappho Memoir. Text selected rendering and a literal translation, which she would continue to read, it said, up until her her death. Um, and why is that important? Sappho lived on a Greek island called Lesbos in 600 BC. The word lesbian literally meant a resident of Lesbos. Ah. So, fun little <laughs> history fact there. Yeah. So just just in case you're wondering, when you're calling someone a lesbian, you're saying they're from Lesbos, right? Which I don't even know yeah, if that place exists anymore. Yeah, that's what they meant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we are from Lesbos. Anyway, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, she's done. I think. So what's, uh, what's really interesting is in 1912, when Sadie was a sophomore, the students put on an original play called The 13th Amendment, a musical comedy about a world without men. Huh. Characters were Helen of Troy, Penelope, Electra, and so on. And Sadie, of course, was Sappho, and she read all of her lines in Greek. And I think that is like the foundation of Wonder Woman right there. So you have these Greek characters, you have a, a world without men. Obviously, Wonder Woman came from an island without men, mm -hmm. heavily rooted in like Greek mythology. Yeah, there's a uh, inspiration there. I could see where an author would meet this person, this highly influential person, and honestly, gears start turning. You know, like. <gasps> That's a great idea. Honestly. But, like, how could Boy Marston not fall in love with this woman? Keep in mind. Like, he knowing what, what how William Marston is at this point. Like, yeah. And keep in mind, they met when um, he was in the eighth grade. Like, he met her in the eighth grade. So, he fell in love with her, like, long before this time. But, yeah. Complete badass. Yeah. But going back to Harvard. Back to Harvard. I thought we don't want to go back to Harvard. No, we don't. Oh, we don't, but we're going to. Okay. <laughs> but we're going to. We have to. All right. So in 1905, Harvard opened its state-of-the-art psychology research lab in Emerson Hall, designed by a German psychologist named Hugo Mostenberg. Hugo, who had been brought in to help build the lab, ended up taking on a full-time position at Harvard and was elected the president of the American Psychology Association. His research was said to be centered around perception, emotion, reaction, and sensation. Hmm. Among from having rabbits, guinea pigs, and mice in cages for experiments, he also liked to experiment on female students. Oh, wow. <laughs> Now, That's what the fuck? Now, since we are painting a comic book villain here, um, <laughs> he was highly against women's rights to education and against the women's suffrage movement. He actually believed the only reason a woman should be educated was, she, was to make a better housewife. Wait, this is a comic book villain? No, oh, this is a real person. So it's a real person, but 
Marston writes him later into a comic book villain. I mean, like, I, like, I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that was my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I'm listening to him, like, is this a comic book villain or, like, an actual, like, person that's, like, not a good person, obviously. And, of course, he's against women being educated. How else is he going to continue his experiments on women if they're smart? That's, that's nuts. Yeah, that's very. That's a very good point. Like, how could you justify that? Oh, I experiment on other humans. So it, it is key to note, um, for instance, I do not know the level of experiments that he did on women. Um, William Marston, for instance, did experiments on female students when he becomes a college professor. However, it was simply like monitoring like their blood pressure. Very ethical okay. experiments. I would, I didn't... No. So we actually don't know. However, this is very interesting because we know what William Marston, like what his experiments he does, and it is kind of based off of Hugo's experiments. So keep in mind, mm, okay. um, he was he was interested in, for instance, um, perception, emotion, reaction, and sensations. So I don't think when we say like experiments, I don't think he was like you know, like trying these radical chemicals on female okay. students or anything. Like oh, okay. That. But okay. But still, like, no. Why not? So <laughs> there's actually a San Francisco Chronicle art article about Professor Hugo where he states that women are not fit for jury duty as they are unwilling to listen to argument and cannot be brought to change their opinion on any subject. That is a direct quote. Wow, someone said that about women. <laughs> That's what shocks me. Jeez, like what? <laughs> um, Hilarious. This guy. Wow. Ir irony? Right. Right? It also... He also goes on, or through my research, I, I also found out that he fought against uh, women to have the right to vote, saying they had too much to do at home to understand politics and express that they would easily be corrupted with their feeble minds. Is that typical uneducated male opinion? Like can Arrogance. We just, can we get away from that? Arrogance. It just comes from arrogance. It kind of comes down to just the men at this time just wanted to keep women in the household, like as housewives. That's Imagine being a woman and reading that back then and understanding politics and being just, wow. Well, that's so that's kind of the sad part here is that keep in mind during this time, um, only 4% of Americans went to college and like a very small percentage of that were women. Oh, you mean the women that they weren't allowing an education? Yeah. So I, mm. I kind of feel like it was very rare to have a very educated woman. Almost like it was on purpose. I mean, yeah. Prevent them from getting education and then they can't fight for their rights because they don't understand, which is bullshit. Yeah. In a way, it was um, back then like modern day slavery, right? Because you don't let them become educated. You kind of brainwash them from a very early age that you're supposed to just go home and be a wife. Yeah. Yeah. Go raise the next generation of America, please. Yeah. And we still, it's crazy because there's still people that think that today. Like, oh, yeah. Which. I mean, it just it just goes to show that like no matter how much progression there is, there's still people that will not that r seem like they refuse to progress. They refuse to become educated. Yeah, they'll die eventually. <laughs> Those people will become extinct. Hopefully, their children will decide to not be ignorant. That's all we can hope, or that they just don't procreate. Oh yeah. That's always an option. So getting back to William. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point in his sophomore year, 
William becomes very impressive at college. He's getting A's in classes that typically doesn't hand out A's. Um, And he actually gets hired to be an assistant to Hugo to do experiments on women at Radcliffe College. Um, Now, when William Marston was hired, his experiments were designed to detect deception, which Hugo had been working on for years now. What's really kind of interesting, again, painting this like kind of classic comic book villain, um, around this time, Hugo starts getting into a lot of trouble, if you will. Ooh. So Hugo, coming from Germany, believed that Germany was superior than America. <gasps> I see where this is going. Notions of equal rights for women was an example to him of America being weak and starting to crumble. His military views of Germany were so bad that eventually people started calling for his deportation in 1907. So, and also it's key to note in 1910 and through 1911, he spent his time in Berlin. And when he, when he returned, people were convinced he was a spy by the time he was, By the time he hired William Marston as an assistant in 1912, Hugo's professional career was almost over. Makes sense. Wow. Now, during William Marston's second year at college, his father's business started to fail. So he decided to pay his way through college by writing scenarios, which at the time were movie scripts. So at this time... uh, picture shows or movies were just kind of emerging. So this, this was very new kind of like technology. Um, people would pay, I believe, 25 cents to go see a movie. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> they would pay five cents to go see a movie. Now, 25 cents, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Way too expensive. Full tank of gas. What are you talking about? <laughs> and also they paid $25 her movie script wrote. So during his sophomore year, he actually became a, if you will, a movie script writer. Mm. So during this time, with his help from Sadie, he actually runs experiments uh, monitoring blood pressure as students read from sealed envelopes where some are told truths and some are told lies. Um, Another set of students acting as a jury tried to tell which one was telling the truth. The results were that he was able to tell if someone was lying 90% of the time, whereas the jury was only correct about 50% of the time. Thus, the lie detector was born. Wow. That was a little baby lie detector, a little baby cute little lie detector. (laughs) Yeah, but that was like the primitive stuff that built like blood pressure and stuff. Like not a little baby, a little baby lie detector, a little baby. Baby blood detector. (laughs) Okay, moving on. Now, William would go on to be the charter president of Phi Beta Kappa and graduate on June 24th, 1915 as Magna Cum Impressive. Um, He would be accepted into uh, grad school. Sadie graduated just before him on June 16th that same year. For her 22nd birthday, he actually got her a book of pro- uh, poems and underlined this little poem. Quote, I saw a cat, t'was but a dream, who scorned the slave that brought her cream. What? Cream cat. Uh, so what's kind of funny here is William Marston actually wrote in the margin, um, it sounds a little filthy, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's why I was like, oh, is yeah. that what I heard it was? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of just kind of like a fun little tidbit I found when doing some research. thought I would throw that in there. <laughs> Cute. So in September, they both got married, and even though Sadie liked her name, William convinced her to change her name to Betty Marston. Oh, I like Sadie so much. Yeah, we're going to continue to use Sadie because I just don't like that. <laughs> yeah. I like Sadie. Sadie's such a pretty name. Yeah, and I, I thought this was, like, really interesting um, because 
we're we're going to get into it a little bit later, but William Marston, he is a submissive male in his relationship. He believes that women are superior. But there are examples where he kind of contradicts that. So, like, for instance, like, making her change her name. Yeah. And there, there, there's a few other examples. I just kind of don't like it. Um, well, what was the purpose for her changing her name? So it does not state. So we don't know the purpose of that. There may be a fundamental reason that we just don't know because time. Correct. Yeah. So I just thought it was, like, a little odd. Yeah, well, there um, might be more to that. It might not be that he pushed for that. Or maybe he did. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. A lot of people do weird things for weird reasons. I I am interested in your opinion once we learn how Olive gets introduced into the relationship. So we're going to revisit that. Because mm-hmm. that's, that's like the hard part for me is that like doing all the research – when I go back and I look at like these small little tidbits, I'm like, oh. In comparison to the movie. There we go. Well, just like it, like as the, I guess like knowing the ending of the story already, it's like these little, I'm like, is that a clue? What is that? <laughs> is that a clue? <laughs> I think I found a clue. So in September, they both got married. Um, he went on to Harvard Law School, she went on to Boston Law School. She did really well in her studies, whereas William seemed to be more focused on proving his lie detector, never earning higher than a C in any class. Mm. Um, She would go later on to say that when, okay, so here we go. She would go on to say that she was stuck when asked about changing her name. So there's like that one little tidbit. But I also still want to revisit it once we. She was on the fence about it. Once we like kind of. Is that what I'm I'm hearing? Well, for me, when I say when when I stuck. read that she was stuck, I feel like she didn't have a choice. Mm. Mm. Like. She was married to William, or she was going to marry William, and. She that was didn't kind of an ultimatum, like, right. change your name or, we're not doing this. I don't know if it was that intense. Um, but Probably it was not. something she felt that she had to do yeah. for some reason. And we just right. can't really explore that any further. And and keep in mind, like, in this society where, you know, men were the controlling force of a marriage or a household, it was kind of more like whatever the male decided, that mm-hmm. was it. Like, that was the end of discussion. That was the way, you know, this is the way. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, So kind of like keep that in mind as well. So back then, if your husband said to like do something, you really didn't have a choice. Like you kind of had to do it. It's kind of how I view it. Yeah, it is that time uh, period of of history where men were in control of their wives and and women as a whole, which is sad. So on April 6th, 1917, America declared war on Germany. What was supposed to also happen that day, that same day? I forgot to turn off my straightener. (laughs) What? So that same day, a bill was supposed to be presented into Congress to give women the right to vote. Oh. Okay, so Congress declares war on the same day day that women's rights were supposed to pass well it was supposed to be introduced to congress to be fair we don't know if it was going to pass or not you know how politics okay so Mm -hmm. we declare war on the same day that we were supposed to look into women getting rights yes just by chance yeah (laughs) i wonder if it's a coincidence okay so we're gonna change speeds a little bit if you watch the movie you know about olive mm-hmm. yes so let's bring her into the picture <gasps> let's bring olive into the picture let's bring yeah olive. oh <laughs> so olive Byrne was born 1904 
in Corning, New York. I'm from New York. You are. Do you know where Corning is? No, it, she doesn't. I, I have no idea. And she a lot of New York people would probably be like, you don't know where Corning is? Yeah, but all people from New York feel that they need to tell people they're from New it's York. It's important. Who do you think I am? I lived in New York. So, <clears throat> moving back on to Olive. Yeah, she's from New York. She's from New York. Um, it is said that her aunt... So, I Olive's backstory is very interesting to me. It is said that her aunt, who was a nurse, delivered Olive at their house. However, when Olive's father came home drunk and Olive's mother could not stop her from crying, her father threw the baby out the door into a snowbank. Oh, my goodness. Mm? Her aunt ran out, grabbed the baby, and her father went back to the bar and didn't return for a few days. What the f***? His... His daughter's born, and he just throws her out the f***ing door? And also keep in mind, so history is wrote from the perspective of the victor. So this could be extremely exaggerated. Yeah. We are relying on other people's, like, testimony, journals, diaries. Yeah, we like don't that. have footage of her being thrown out yeah. into the snow. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> but... Because like, time... Usually the exaggerations and the exaggeration of the truth. So there was some truth there. I do believe there's some truth in which that. any kind of motion of like, even if it's like putting a baby outside in the snow, that itself is fucking terrible because it's a newborn that you're putting out in the cold. What's wrong with you? It's yeah. a baby. It's yeah. a baby. It's not only a baby, a newborn. It's a baby. It's a baby. So let's let's continue on with Olive's childhood, shall we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Her mother Ethel, Ugh. trying to keep her to keep Olive from crying, one time gave Olive so much medicine containing morphine that she slept for two days, and a doctor had to be called to wake her back up. As a child, as a child, yes. What the f- is wrong with her parents? However, well, I mean, what do they know of morphine back then? Right. Other than it just, it stops, it makes well, pain stop. And also you're like, keep in mind, um, I'm not oh, sure exactly yeah, when like Coca-Cola came out, but when Coca-Cola first came out, it had cocaine in it. Yeah. I mm-hmm. forgot what, what time we're talking. We about. didn't understand yeah. drugs back then. Forgot what time we time. used lead paint for everything. Like mm-hmm. this is not a good time. Yeah. So. I keep forgetting the time period. Mm-hmm. Um, however, when Olive was three and her brother is five, their mother took her to her husband's parents' house and disappeared. Olive's grandparents adopted them and told them both that um, their parents had died. Oof. Yes. I don't know if that was a, a the lie to tell. <laughs> well, the lie detector test wasn't developed yet. Um, however, in 1913, when Olive was nine, her father did actually pass away. And when she was 10, both her grandparents passed away, putting Jeez. Olive in a Catholic orphanage. God, she had a really rough childhood. Now, it is key to know who her aunt is. Her aunt is Margaret Sanger. Another really important name in women's suffrage. Yes. Yes. Very important. So that is who delivered her. Um, She believed in free love, socialism, and feminism. You know, her delivering uh, her niece, Olive, was probably one of the easiest things she's done in her life compared to, like, the movements she's fought for in women's suffrage. And to me, it's a little sad because she was a very profound figure. However, it was at a cost. Mm. Which we're about to learn about. Oh, no. So, um, in 1912, Margaret Sanger wrote a 12-part series in New York called What Every Girl Should Know. It covered sexual attraction, masturbation, intercourse, venereal disease, pregnancy and childbirth part 12 was called some consequences of ignorance and silence which was banned 
and replaced with, quote, what every girl should know, comma, all caps, nothing, end quote. What? Hmm. That's... Oh. Nothing. In 1914, uh, Margaret Sanger, Sanger and Ethel Byrne started publishing a woman rebel, um, sorry, started publishing the Women Rebel, a monthly feminism magazine where they coined the term birth control. Mm. Um, six out of seven of the magazines were seized and declared obscene. Uh, Sang- Sanger fled the country going to England where she gathered research on birth control. There she met Havlick Ellis, a doctor and psychologist who wrote many banned works, some include including Sexual Inversion, um, Studies in the Psychology of the Sex. He wrote actually all six volumes of that. Some of his ideas were empathy towards uh, homosexuality, evolution of marriage has resulted in women without sexual pleasure, which was cruel, and erotic rights of women were just as important as political rights. Hmm. Hmm. The fact that she had to flee the country. I mean, that's it was what year? So we're looking at, I want to say about 1915? Yeah. 1914. Yeah, fled the country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that checks out. Now, Sanger and Ellis became lovers. Um, Sanger wrote a 15-page pamphlet on what she learned in uh, Europe called Family Limitation. Now, getting into some of the costs, her husband in 1915 was arrested for handing out that pamphlet. A judge told him, quote, your crime is not only in violation of the laws of man, but the laws of God as well. Huge eye roll. Yeah. 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 So, um, Margaret Sanger actually returned to the United States to be with her daughter, Peggy, who had contracted pneumonia and unfortunately later passed away. Mm. Uh, Sanger was devastated to hear her daughter when she was holding her. Um, Evidently, one of the last things her daughter told her was I want Aunt Ethel to hold me not you and this is in regards to probably her daughter viewed her like just kind of like picking the feminist movement over her and like kind of fleeing the country running off um, so that when she did return she her daughter wanted nothing to do with her and then she did yeah. pass away because she cared about her cause too much right over her own blood yes mm. it happens but how many times have we had to cut family off for what we believe in it just sucks when it comes from a child yeah i know some of our listeners are probably going to say that she was very mm. selfish that she ran to europe got a European lover and was having the time of her life. And while her husband was being arrested um, and she left her children. However, keep in mind, this was also, it was illegal for birth control. So, you know, mothers are having children that they do not want. Yes. um, With people they do not want to have them with. And, you know, Sanger did express like free love. And I, I'm hoping there was some sort of like communication between her and her husband, some sort of understanding with that, that they were able to kind of come to terms with. Um, we simply do not know. It happened. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> it, it, who it, knows? it happened over 100 years ago. While she was in the United States, she was arrested. She was supposed to be put on trial. Uh, she refused a lawyer. She wanted to represent herself. However, the court dropped the trial in fear of a grie- grieving mother would help her cause. Mm. So they essentially they did not want press. And it is stated that Sanger was furious to not get her day in court. Um, her and Ethel actually opened up a clinic to show how condoms were used. However, nine days after the clinic, an undercover policewoman pretending to be a mother of two attended the clinic 
and they were both later arrested. Uh, Their crime was distributing any recipe, drug, or medicine for the uh, prevention of conception. Which is like, in, I know we've stated this so many times now, but that's like insane, insane today. to like, be arrested for. <laughs> yeah, well, like, we're seriously. Hey, uh, I'm arresting you for s- practicing safe sex. Right. You're under arrest. You need to make babies. You need to make babies, and you need More HIV. More babies. <laughs> I need all of the babies. You will get chlamydia and die. Jeez. It's insane. Well, because we need more soldiers. Yeah. We're just a giant farm for our military. (laughs) What a concept. All right. I mean, to a degree, right? Like, you have to have a population willing to go into the military to have a very large, strong military. I mean. Yeah, and then we send the soldiers to the high schools to pick more up as soon as they're fresh, you know? Put them in I, boot almost, camp. I, almost, I almost got pulled into that. I almost got, wait. Yeah, I did. Never mind. When I was 18 <laughs> and uh, we graduated, I scheduled an appointment with a, a Marine recruiter. I think in like the high school time, right, you, you're trying to, f- figure yourself out you want to escape like out from underneath your parents you want to rebel the military's there and it's like hey you want to go like travel the world i want to like do something cool play like call of duty right (laughs) (laughs) you want to travel the world real quick Mm. all right so back to the story um ethel was sentenced to 30 days in jail where she went on a hunger strike The story made the New York Times front page four days in a row. Fuck yeah. Good on her. This caused picketing outside the White House. Good. Ethel went a week without eating or drinking before the prison started force feeding her milk and raw eggs while she was passed out. Holy shit. What the? (laughs) This is really bad. Like. Did you say raw eggs? Raw eggs, yeah. It's, Why? It's a good source of protein. Yeah, but they were force feeding it to her while she has passed out against her, like that. Yeah, that is against yeah, like human rights. Like, well, oh. well, uh, this was before women had <laughs> human rights. Yeah. Okay. This yeah, you is forget. Just, it's just <laughs> devastating to hear this right now, coming from force oh feeding it eggs. It, you did not know you were signing up for this when you were like, I'm going to tune in for a podcast about William Marston and kink and polyamory, probably. Raw eggs. Raw eggs, yes. That's that's why, um, for instance, like, I'm not sure if, if you guys know, but there's like a, it's very common to do like a raw egg shake in the morning. Yeah. It's like, not pure protein, but it, it provides a lot of protein. Yeah. So gross. Milk and eggs. Um, fun fact. She became the first female in US in the US prison system to be force fed. Now what's very interesting about this is that her sister, um Sanger, actually went to the governor's office and pleaded for her sister to be released from prison, stating that she was not going to survive because she knew her sister would continue to go on hunger strikes and she was really worried that she was going to die in prison. Um, so Sanger actually proposed that her sister would have nothing to do with the birth control movement if she was released from, from prison um, and then that she would take kind of full responsibility if anything did happen. Now, at the time, Ethel was passed out unconscious. Uh, she couldn't speak on her for herself. So the govern- governor did pardon her. She was released from prison. However, Ethel never forgave her sister for taking her out of the birth control fight. She had all the pieces on her side. Like, she was ready to put put people in checkmate. Yeah, like, she's making some big moves there. Yeah. And then to be pulled out of the fight when you're, you're, you're like, 
You, she said she was in the headlines for four days in a row. Yeah, yes. I, I could see why she was upset. Let's be honest, though. Her sister probably didn't understand as much. Unless it was directly explained to her, like, hey, leave me alone. Let me handle this. I am basically, if anything happens to me, I'm a martyr for the cause. Like, this literally enforces our cause more. If they let me die, like, like essentially what that's her move was that she's going to starve herself. If they force feed her, it's bad. If they let her die, it's bad on them. If like anything they do at that point, it's looks bad on them. Cause it's clearly unethical. Yeah. And I can see why she would be so upset for her sister to pull her out. But you can also see it from the other side. Like it's family. Like you don't like you're going to care. And her sister probably saw it as I'm going to protect her from herself in this situation. I don't want my, yeah. I don't want to lose my sister over this. The day after her sister was released from prison, um, Sanger was sentenced to 30 days in prison as well. Uh, she served the entire 30 days. She did not go on a hunger strike. She just evidently very peacefully served her time and then got out. Mm. So I bet you that didn't go over well with her sister Ethel. I think I think it was more so she was mad again about like being kind of taken out of oh. the movement. Probably hurt her spirit a lot. Yeah. But it just, it goes to show like how different they handle the situation and how differently they feel about the situation. What's St. do next? So when Oliver, when Oliver was 16, she went and visited her, her mother for the first time in 10 years. Um, Sanger went on to fight for birth control, divorcing her husband and starting a long affair with famous author H.G. Wells. Wow. What? What? Yeah. No shit. Holy shit. I, Everyone knows H.G. Wells. Yeah, this is this this story is insane with like the name drops that just like kind of <laughs> casually happen like yeah. throughout like this world is getting smaller and smaller the oh, more yeah. we yeah. Wow. In his 1922 book The Secret Places of My Heart Sanger is the inspiration of the hero's lover. Um, between 1920 and 1926, Sanger's two books, um, Woman and the New Race and Pivot of Civilization, sold a combined total of over one million copies. Um, however, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was signed and women were granted the right to vote. Finally. Finally. Uh, one book specifically caught attention. Uh, Woman of the New Race was picked up by both Mr. and Mrs. Marston, who in 1920 were both studying for grad degrees in psychology, which would later be used in the creation of Wonder Woman. In fact, when later on, once Wonder Woman is already established, um, and William Marston actually hires a writer to kind of write some of the Wonder Woman stories, this book is actually given to the writer and says, like, here's everything you need to know about Wonder Woman. So this is, like, this is insane. Keep in mind, William Marston does not know who Olive is, but they have a copy of her aunt's book. That's wild. This is yeah. insane. <laughs> like, the wow. world is so small, like you wow. said. Like, uh I can't, I can't believe it. All right. So we covered a lot in today's episode. Uh, next time we're going to pick up Olive going to college. Spicy. Yeah. And, and her life is so spicy so far. All the spiciness. And falling in love with one of her college professors. Oh, I wonder who it could be. And then also the... I guess the evolution of uh, William Marston and Sadie Holloway's kind of marriage and the kind of formation into the poly relationship that they had. A love triangle. Love triangle. Yeah. So, and if you saw the movie already, then you know this is kind of where things are going to kind of get picked up. So a lot of what we've kind of stated already hasn't really been in the movie so far 
Yeah. But now the next episode is going to kind of like kick into what the movie covered. Yeah. And hopefully we will do our best to un-Hollywood what the movie did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. I think uh think we'll be able to draw out some comparisons between the movie and actuality, real life. Yeah. I'm excited. But hopefully you are still listening and you're not too too bored about this subject. I I find it fascinating. It's it's insane uh learning about this. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I did not know the majority about like the women's rights movement. I knew like the basic, very broad, like and all of the names. All and of the, the names. all of the like I, I feel like we'd have Charlie somewhere like <laughs> Take a look at this. Jesus oh, Christ. Charlie. That right there is the mail. Now let's talk about the mail. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail for you all day. And someone that's coming up in the next episode is J. Edgar Hoover gets oh. introduced into the That's episode. right. I do yep. remember that part. Yep. Okay. Oh yeah, goodness. that's exciting. Thank you. It's unnatural to some. We've been talking about William Marston a little bit more. This is part two of a many part series. So stay tuned for more. We'll be coming at you with part three soon. Until next time. Stay kinky. It's Jenny Banks signing out.